house. I know you want to buy a bigger house. Like you've got the money, you've got two hundred thousand dollars of equity in your house, whatever, because prices have gone up in the last six, seven years. What if we just look at taking a home equity line of credit, renting out your house? Let's just look in your neighborhood. What are homes renting for? And then see what your new mortgage payment would be. How much difference is between the three mortgages and the rent coming in your new mortgage payment? Like, where's the delta and monthly payment difference? And does that make sense for you in the long term? Let's look at this 10, 15 years down the line. Welcome to the She's Got Assets Real Estate Investment Podcast. I'm the host, Shona Lepis. Follow along as we unpack and demystify real estate investment strategies through expert interviews and personal experience. From how to find off-market deals to creative financing to long-term and midterm rentals, we aim to educate and inspire others to gain financial freedom and generational wealth through real estate. And as always, please subscribe so you never miss an episode. We really appreciate reviews. It helps others find us and just helps us get found. Welcome to the She's Got Assets podcast. Today, I have a special guest, Jordan Lee. He is a certified mortgage broker and advisor in Portland, Oregon. He's doing lots of cool stuff, really active in the community. So Jordan, thank you so much for taking the time. I'd love to have you give us a little details about yourself and where you're at with investing. Oh, thank you so much, Shana. Yeah, I really appreciate you having me on the show. It's interesting. Real estate is a, a second career for me. I I was, I didn't go and get, I fell into real estate like a lot of us did. I didn't. In high school, I wasn't like, oh, I want to be a loan officer when I grew up. Like, I, I didn't know that was it. Yeah. I didn't know that was any sort of career option or path that would be something that to aspire to or that I could see myself doing. I just eventually found my way here. I actually, my first career was in, in culinary. So I, after college, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I had this inkling that I wanted to open a restaurant, but. It wasn't like 100% set that way. So I spent a year in China, like teaching English on a fellowship program through my college. And while I was there, I was cooking in kitchens on the side a little bit. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to come back to, I grew up in Salem. So I was like, okay, I'm going to come back to the Salem, Portland area, go to culinary school. Obviously there's culinary schools in Portland and maybe I'll open a restaurant. And so I cooked for a while and worked in kitchens for about six years, started back. And this was, I graduated from college in 2008. I was getting into the economy right at that time where it was like, basically I had to work for free for a while in order to get a job. And then the only reason why I was able to get one is because a spot opened up at one of the top local restaurants. And yeah, at that time, I think cooks were getting paid. I started at $11 an hour where Fast forward to a couple of years ago, wages have gone up nicely. Like I just saw an advertisement on a movie theater for a cook at a movie theater making $19 an hour. So it's a totally different environment, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, so I was cooking. I think by the time I left, my, I started at $11 an hour, went to my, at one of the top restaurants, a James Beard Award winning restaurant in town. By the time I left, I was making maybe 13, which was three years later, and I took on a chef position. And then it was like, I got a decent salary, which would could like afford living, could, felt like I could have a kid. And at that point, I, I had actually purchased a house while I was still working at $11 an hour, because this was back in 2012 when rates were low and home mm -hmm. prices were still recovering. I think the home that I first bought, we bought for $210,000 and the original owner had bought it in two, 2007 for 240. So there was like, they had lost out a little bit. Mm -hmm. wow. And it, I had gotten, I had no intention of, I became an accidental investor, right? I had no intention of buying a home. I hadn't planned on it, but my grandma passed away and my parents were like, do you want to take this inheritance chunk now and, and buy a home? It seems like it might be a good time to buy a home. They were hoping that, I think probably hoping that we would start a family because I was married. Can't uh, yeah. yeah. And, and, and so I was like, I guess so. Like, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. 
And yeah, so he went in, talked to the bank, didn't go very well. Got a referral from a real estate agent, didn't go very well. Ended up finding a new real estate agent who referred me to a loan officer who's actually my colleague now. And so, yeah, after I got to that point in the restaurant world where it was like, I reached that space where it was either start my own restaurant if I want to keep growing, keep earning more, keep learning more, mm -hmm. or do something else. And when I looked at the finances of that, it just, I couldn't find like what I wanted. First of all, I, it didn't look good on paper. I, I got a business, I, I worked with SCORE, which is a local business consulting organization. I'm not sure if you've heard of them. It's a national nonprofit and they offer free business consulting. It's like retired business owners basically that, and they match you with somebody that's bought and has some experience in that field. So we looked over financials together and looked at a couple of different restaurants and he said, this one could work. Well, you're going to be working these hours. <laughs> this is going to be your salary and the margin is going to be 10% and you have a bad month and right. <laughs> your margins erased. So I was like, I, I like cooking, but maybe it's a passion of mine, but maybe I, for a career, I don't need to do what I think is my one passion at the time. Because mm -hmm. I think that's a struggle for a lot of people. Maybe for some people, they know what they want to do. They have a passion and it just like naturally leads into a career that they, that is fulfilling for them. And for me, like I, I did really enjoy cooking and I liked that, like being on my feet and working with my hands, but there was parts about it that I didn't like. I had, I didn't really have any mentors in the field that was like, oh, this person, I want their life. This, mm -hmm. that person. He's got a really good family life. They, they're really financially set up. Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't find someone that I wanted to model my career afterwards. Mm -hmm. And you know what I mean? It was like, it just didn't quite fit what I had envisioned for a long-term success. And so I was like, okay, cooking swan. I'm not really at this point able to find a model that works for it. Maybe there's something else I could try. And I started reading books got interested in finance and that's when I mm. sort of pivoted in it. I'd had owned a home already and I was like, maybe I could think about building passive income through real estate and I'll figure out how to do that for myself and help my friends and the family along the way. And so I reached out to the loan officer that did my loan and she's my colleague now. That's so cool. I, back in college and high school, I was in the front end waitressing restaurant businesses. It's tough, man. <laughs> I thought I'd waitress forever at one point. And yeah, it's it's not easy. I totally relate to that. I also love with real estate, I feel like it's a really windy path. Like no one really just wakes up and is, yeah, I'm going to get into real estate because it feels very intimidating and you can figure out a way to get into it. But whatever you're previously doing, I think you take some of that with you, I feel like. Yeah, I don't think there's one playbook of how to do investing, how to do mortgage, how to do real estate. Mm -hmm. And I think experience from other fields can be very useful. I've seen car salesmen do well, but then I've seen people that with no sales experience do really well. You've seen yeah. engineers set up really good systems and just be really consistent. So I think, yeah, like to your point, there's... You can mold your own path. There's no one way of being a good client advocate, and there's no one way of investing. Yeah. That kind of leads me lots of things, lots of questions. But I, you bought your, it's funny because I bought my first house for 210 too. And at the time, it was like, <laughs> it was very scary. I had a roommate, strangers on Craigslist. So that's funny. But it what was year like, was this? 2005. Okay, 2005. Okay, so that was like when prices were high. Yeah, uh, but you know what? It was stated income. Oh, and it was, okay, <laughs> so I, you weren't having to go through the rigmarole of qualifying. In it. No, my mortgage guy was like, because I was self-employed, like, don't you make a little more? <laughs> Interesting. And what kind of loan did you get? It was, God, it was a long time ago. I think it might have been a five-year with the balloon, but I got into it, and then I refinance out of it but that first house like I pulled equity out and did a, was the was like the start of my 
because I saw the equity going up and then I was like, holy, in a year it went up like 40K. It was just like, and then the crash happened, but. And were you able, but you were able to hold on to it after the crash and kind of like figure things out? This was like pre, I didn't know what house hacking was. I had, I'm like, my plan was I had an upstairs and I had a roommate and I was like, I'm not sharing the downstairs. I put ads on Craigslist, I was single at the time. And it was, I just had a roommate. That's how I offset my rent. So I was very intentional about knowing it was probably over my head, but I had to help with $500 for the rooms upstairs. So smart. Yeah. I mean, for me, I was married at the time. Like we didn't think about doing that. I was just like, okay, my monthly payment is about the same as my apartment payment yeah <laughs> like <laughs> so it that's works. okay yeah totally but yeah but that kind of leads me to a topic of i love the idea of buying your starter house it's maybe not your dream house and then leveraging that into you know your future future thing which i know that's a topic you like so i'd love to hear you unpack that a little bit yeah i think there's this idea of building or buying a forever home um oh, I, I need to be in this house for quite a long period of time because it's not worth it otherwise. Mm-hmm. I didn't, I, and, and those averages change, but it's pretty surprising to me now when someone's in their home for like more than seven years or mm-hmm. low for that matter. I still have the same loan on my old house, but we were there, I guess we were there for eight years. And I think for us at the time, we looked at quite a few places over a few months, even though this was a time when there was like a lot of inventory and you could get your offer accepted. But for whatever reason, we had just, we had such a tight budget and I didn't want something that I had to do a lot of maintenance on. Mm-hmm. Um, I, not a, I wasn't super handy and I just felt like we wanted to get something super manageable. Mm-hmm. I, and then... So that's your main motivation factor when you, for me, when I bought my first house. But then later we realized maybe we wanted to be in a little bigger yard, a little bigger house to to have a little bit more room for a third kid. And different, we wanted, maybe we wanted to change a school district or be closer to the parents. And so there's like a lot of things that you can come up later in life that you're just totally not thinking about when you buy your, your first home. And so I think it's dangerous to be like, oh, yeah, I just want to buy my forever home and spend everything on that Mm -hmm. first one because like life changes pretty easily and it can really make you decide, oh, actually, maybe I don't want to be here forever. And then you need to go back and be like, okay, now I have to sell because all my equity is trapped in here and I can't afford to change my monthly payment or I can't rent this out for what I, what I need to rent it out for and able to make my ends meet. So I think it's good to start with, like you were saying, a kind of starter home and not necessarily be like, oh, this is definitely going to be an investment, but maybe have that in the back of your mind. Mm-hmm. What would happen if later on you had to relocate for a job or X, Y, Z reason, what are you going to do with that home? If it's, if that happens in one year or versus selling it, I might not be able to afford the fees. I might not have an equity, enough equity to afford the fees that cost to sell it, Mm -hmm. or the market might be down a little bit, might not have appreciated enough. So you need to be able to like, just think a little bit about, is there a a potential situation where you can convert it into a rental? And, and I'd always had that long-term plan just from reading books and, and from Starting in real estate four years after I bought it, I was like, I, I thought that was going to be my plan, but it takes a long time for, well, at least it did for me to be in that position. Some folks have a very nice income trajectory, right? That just goes like this. But for a lot of us, it, can, it might go up and then it might go sideways and it might go down and then it might go up again. Yeah. It might be hard to predict that point where you'll feel comfortable doing that but that's the great thing about real estate is just over time it it appreciates it might not go it might not be a meteoric rise Mm -hmm. but goes up consistently over time and your mortgage payment stays the same and yeah what we were able to do which was a strategy that i tried to convince so many of my clients 
I was like, okay, what if we just look, I know you want to buy a new house. I know you want to buy a bigger house. Like you've got the money, you've got $200,000 of equity in your house, whatever, because prices have gone up in the last six, seven years. What if we just look at taking a home equity line of credit, renting out your house. Let's just look in your neighborhood. What are homes renting for? And then see what your new mortgage payment would be. How much difference is between the three mortgages and the rent coming in your new mortgage payment? Like, where's the delta and monthly payment difference? And does that make sense for you in the long term? Let's look at this 10, 15 years down the line. How much have you paid down your mortgage? How much more will this appreciate? What is your overall real estate portfolio and retirement portfolio look like? So like that. I always try and have that conversation with people and it's, it's really hard. It doesn't work for everyone, right? There, a lot of people are just like, oh no, I don't want to deal with that. I don't want to mess with this. But for me, it was, a, I, I talked about it a lot, but it really changed when I did it because it was like, I went from that smaller home to a larger home, more comfortable home that kind of hit all the things that we were looking for. Mm-hmm. And it felt like I was cheating because I didn't save, because <laughs> I didn't save anything. Save with your down payment. Right. It, I just pulled the equity from the house, got the new one. The the tenant was paying my current, my old mortgage and the HELOC payment covered more than that. And there was cash flow on top of that to offset the new mortgage payment. Of course, market changes like raise change like it's not always going to be that smooth of a transition Mm -hmm. but it yeah it just it works out really nicely in in the sense that I, I just think about a home very similar to the way I think about what I put into my IRA and my 401k Mm-hmm. And by 529s, those are on auto draw every month. They go out of there. I don't touch that money. That money is going to be compounding over the next 30 years or 18 years to the kids' college accounts, right? Mm-hmm. And like, I don't want to touch that. I want them to grow. S- same thing with my house. You know, every month we're, you're paying the mortgage payment. There's four or five line items on there, right? There's principal, there's interest, there's taxes, there's insurance. Maybe mm-hmm. there's mortgage insurance. <laughs> yeah. But that principal, that's going into your retirement bucket. Mm-hmm. So if you can hold on to those, then there, then your retirement bucket it just gets like bigger and more diverse. Yeah. No, I'm the big fan of, especially HELOCs, because I, what I love about them is that, and it is, it's a risk, right? But it's, to me, it's very calculated. And to your point, if you're like the rents are this, then it's just, I don't know. I guess we're entrepreneurs, right? It seems like it's such a no-brainer. But I think for a lot of people, I've tried to convince multiple people to do that. Because <laughs> you're going to look back at the house and be like, oh, my gosh, if I would have kept that thing, the value is just a lot, right? 10 to 15 years later, any house that you look back at in this mm-hmm. area, you're going to say, wow, I wish I would have. I wish I would have scrounged and, and made a way. <laughs> to do that yeah Um, yeah to your point on HELOCs too like yeah at the time when I pulled my first HELOC it was basically like the mortgage rate was like one or two percent it was a joke that's not always the case and as we saw now my HELOC payments probably doubled as rates went up and so they're adjustable it's you got to be used to that but they're it's you they're also like it's nice right I had paid a chunk of it off over a few years because I had the renter paying it. And then I had a, a tax bill came come up because I did a, like an IRA conversion from a traditional IRA to a, a Roth IRA. Cause I want to, when I retire, when I have, I don't want to be paying any taxes or I want to know what I'm, mm-hmm. I don't want to think about the tax planning as much mm-hmm. anyway. So I had a big tax bill that come up that I wasn't didn't plan mm-hmm. for. And it's really nice to have that home equity on a credit because it's yeah it's a 30-year fixed mortgage is nice because you know exactly what you got to pay for 30 years Mm -hmm. but with the home equity you can pay it down and then use it again and pay it down so as long as you're like cognizant of that i think that can be super super useful both for defense and offense and in finance yeah like i i would say don't like if you're putting into an asset or something that's really strategic not like hey i want to take a vacation (laughs) with my (laughs) keep right right? 
So we've had a couple HELOCs just as, as entrepreneurs' income is, and and then we'll see a house like, oh, we have this HELOC that's tapped. <laughs> so we're like, let's buy it. I don't want to say accidentally, but we've used them for that. And I'm just such a big fan. So for someone that maybe from a lender, right, doesn't understand a HELOC, and I actually was able to lock them too, which was great. So it was pretty. Oh, yeah, that's true. Some of them you can lock for a few years, Mm -hmm. true. which I probably should have done. Yeah. But uh, it's just, it's, and if you're not using it, it's just access to capital is how I saw it versus. Yeah. So for if you're not familiar with the whole HELOC or home equity line of credit, it's essentially a we it's also known as a second mortgage, though it is uh, recorded on title. Right. So you have to be able to qualify for it in the same way that you have to be able to qualify for a normal mortgage. You have to prove the ability to repay. And there are different options for them. There's quite a wide variety of some of them are interest only for the first 10 years, and then it's in the re- interest only and draw period, meaning that you can basically use it like a credit card for the first 10 years and you pay on what you draw. And then the last 20 years, you go into a repayment period, or you can re up it. That's the most basic structures. Some of them are different, some of them are amortized over, like amortized, meaning paid off over a 25 year period or 20 year period. It just, Depends on the provider. I offer from a bunch of different ones. And I have uh, colleagues and friends that I refer out to that offer different offerings because they might have more attractive offerings. But but yeah, you can get them on investment properties as well too. But I I think of it as like a low interest credit card. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's different from a, a fixed mortgage in that as you pay it down with most HELOCs, when you pay them down, your monthly payment goes down right here. So you're only paying on the interest that you've drawn on them. So sometimes, let's say you're doing a, a renovation project on your house and it might take, for whatever reason, 16 or 18 months. It's not like a, a one-time thing. Some people will get a home equity line of credit and then just draw it out over that 16 months. So they're not paying, the if the project was like $150,000, they're not paying that whole $150,000 interest up front. They're paying it in, 10,000, 20,000 increments. And then afterwards they'll be like, okay, now we want to do a cash out refinance and put this into one mortgage. But the amount of interest they'll, they paid over that time period is less because it's just based on what you draw. That makes sense. I didn't, I, I've only, I've always gone to the bank. So it was like pretty, but that, I didn't realize how flexible they were. The other thing is I've had like multiple, I, HELOCs, I felt like spider webs, and then I've refinanced them back into the house. So I think they don't have to be forever, right? You can lock them or bring it back. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. But they do need to be addressed Mm -hmm. since they're attached to your title. Mm -hmm. Anytime you sell or refinance, they need to be addressed. Yeah. Yeah. We did one, like we had, I don't know, it was during COVID and we're in California. We have, we did this huge like refi of all these HELOCs into one, and then we pulled equity out and the paper. Oh, <laughs> and they came to a mobile notary in california during covid the kid, it was just yeah but you i think the other thing that i don't think i don't think i realized till a couple of years ago is you can pull equity out of your investment properties right i think yep. that's... you can get a cash out refinance on investment properties well, which is a 30-year fixed mortgage or you can get a home equity line of credit as well not all lenders offer mm-hmm. a, a home equity line of credit on investment properties. It's a little bit more risky, uh, but, and they might be the amount of like loan that they'll give compared to the value of the house might be on a primary residence, they might give 90%, but on an investment property, they might only give 75%, depending on the, the combined loan to value between your first mortgage and the second mortgage should be capped at. 75% of the total value on investments is typical, but mm-hmm. again, it depends on the lender. Whereas with um, your family, you can go much higher. Yeah. I've actually gotten two HELOCs on one of the properties. Yeah. So, and some position, lenders want to you know? take their position. Yeah. I yeah. have that, which is kind of rare, but. Yeah. No, because we bought the first house, I bought two properties and it was just, yeah. That's the power of leverage, right? In real estate. And that's why it, what other asset can you just, yeah, do that? That's why I think it's... Yeah, I like the options. It just gives you options, right? You can't 
you can get business lines of credit if you have a, a business credit or mm -hmm. that you can collateralize there. Or on the stock market, you can you can take a margin line on your asset there. If the market goes up or down, it can get called. Mm -hmm. And the amount of leverage that you can the amount of leverage that you can get on it is it's, depends on the firm or whatever. It's going to be a little more like a fifty percent max versus real estate, where you're in on a primary residence, you can get ninety seven percent if it's your first time home buyer, right? <laughs> Uh, or maybe yeah. even a hundred if, if you're using a down payment assistance program. So it's, yeah, you can get a lot more leverage on, on real estate. Yeah. And I really like what you said about it is your home, but it also thinking out the potential that you, it might not be for your forever, ever home. And it, it is most people, probably their biggest purchase that they're going to make right initially. Mm -hmm. So I, it's, Along with house hacking, right? This whole kind of new multifamily loans. If I was like 20 something, I'd be all over that. If I didn't have kids yeah. and I was single, I'd be like, I'm there. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I, I wish that our market had more multifamily option right? properties available. <laughs> it's that's the supply of fourplexes is tiny it's and it's tiny. super expensive, but <laughs> yeah. But right. there's, there is a decent amount of duplexes and, and with our new zoning, there'll probably be more duplexes slowly coming onto the market over the next decade. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like to your point, so FHA has always allowed you to do a low down on multifamily properties. But once you get to a three, like for, it, and it's easy for a duplex or a single family with ADU. But when you get to a three or four unit, if, like in the last, decade or so FHA added a, a modifier or a guideline that said you can do this but the if you take the market rents for all four units mm -hmm. the principal interest taxes and insurance on your loan needs to be 75 percent of the market rents needs to equal the, the your monthly payment so like in our market, that just, even if you have more income, even if you can afford the, even if you could afford it, they took a very conservative stance on it. So in our market, it, that almost never meets, they call it sustainability threshold. It almost never meets it. And it's, yeah. So that even though FHA allowed that, it, it wasn't an option for most situations. Now, with new conforming guidelines with conventional loans on a primary residence, you can put as little as 5% down on a, on a fourplex and, and geez, now the loan limit on a fourplex is 1.4 million and change. So <laughs> you could get a huge loan, assuming like you have to be able to qualify it for, so have to prove the ability to repay. And yeah, so that. You could basically, yeah, you could put low down on a two, three, four plex and use the tenants, those potential rents from the other units to help you qualify. And I've even seen like some scenarios where you could have a seller carry behind the, behind the mortgage as well. That, that's all on this market right now, there's, it's interest rates are a little bit higher than that what some folks have on their properties if the seller owned the owned it free and clear and they wanted to carry a portion of the mortgage you could combine that as well um as long as you're still putting that five percent down but yeah it's simple conventional loan you can get on those you can get gift funds yeah as oh, long you, as you, you can get from like a family member or something okay as long as it's from a family member yep you okay. can have a co co-signer as well. So it, it just pretty much follows normal conventional guidelines. And it's a great product for folks that want to get started as investors early on mm -hmm. and offset their kind of mortgage payment and just get access to as much funding as if you're, if your goal is to get access to as much funding as possible with as little leverage as possible, that would be the path of least resistance. I hadn't thought about the owner financing part. That's if you find someone that's free and clear and you're like, hey, would you carry like X 
but yeah, that's really yeah. super creative. And then you could have maybe this the seller. They, there are some stipulations on the seller carry that have to conform with the guidelines, and I I can't remember all of them off the top of my head, but I think it's something like has to be at least a five year. You can't have like a two year balloon seller carrier. It has to okay. be at least five years. I don't think they put a, a stipulation on what the rate ha is though. So if you had a willing seller that that wanted to that was wanted to defer some of their capital gains, mm -hmm. uh, then you could create a situation where you got a pretty good monthly payment on a three or four plex with really low down. And the seller would need to be in in second, right? Obviously, they'd be in second position with the right. loan. Yeah. Loan. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's, yeah, that's the ultimate hack. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Damn, that's really, yeah. Okay, so with, can we run through like a scenario? Say it's 800,000, right? And then you're putting 5% down, right, on that? Yeah. So okay. what, that means 800,000, 5% down, you put it in 40,000 down, right? Okay, yeah. And maybe you have closing costs of whatever, let's just say 15K to be conservative. So you've got 55, so you're in for 55,000. And then if you wanted to, like you could get a loan, you could get the seller to carry is like whatever you want, right? So it could be that you're getting the seller to carry 200,000 or they could carry 400,000 or 100,000. It doesn't necessarily matter as long as you're in for that 5%. Okay, that's skin in the game, right? Yeah, and yeah. then... You, if you're the seller is carrying enough so that your combined loan to value is only 75%, if your loan plus the seller's loan is only equal to, or excuse me, if your loan, if your conventional loan is less than 75% or 80%, so if we do 800,000 times math now. So if your loan is less than 640000 then you don't have to have mortgage insurance either. Yeah. Because your loan to value is at 20%. Like from the conventional lender's point of view, there's a little bit less risk that way, um, and they don't need to put mortgage insurance on it. And then you'll get better pricing if your loan to value is even less, even though your combined loan to value is still at 95%. Oh, really? So they're just yeah, looking at that chunk, not the... Yeah, they look at their position. It's just like this game of chess, right? It's a little bit, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and they have their own modifiers. There is a price yeah. buyer for having a second loan behind it, but... but what it is that? Can you unpack that a little bit? I don't know what that like means, like a... Just basically to get the same rate. So, so there's lots of things that modify your rate on a mortgage, right? Okay. So if you have an 800 credits or excuse me 780 credit score you're gonna get the most favorable pricing right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. now though that pricing can be modified by a lot of factors so if it's a primary residence it's going to be different than a second home mm -hmm. or an investment property mm -hmm. and those will be modifiers that will add to the rate so for you know, they'll add to the pricing for the rate so if if the base rate is 7% with 780 um, FICO score and a primary residence, they might add one and a half percent, one and a half points or one and a half percent of the loan, not to the rate, but to the price to get that same rate. So to get 7% yeah. on an investment, rate, it costs you just for example, one and a half percent of the loan amount more to get that same rate. Okay. And so there's other modifiers, right? So if your credit score is lower than 780, then you'll have a modifier that is negative. If you're, if it's a multifamily, you'll have a modifier that makes the pricing worse as well, because it's more risk. But anything that's more risky, mm -hmm. it makes the modif it makes your pricing worse. Uh, it modifies it in a worse direction, right? So things like higher loan to value ratio, higher debt to income ratio, lower credit score, higher number of units, investment property. Those are all like mm -hmm. 
risk factors and that, that give you worse pricing. And then you, on a flip side, you can improve your pricing with various moder- modifiers, such as having a better credit score or putting more money down, right? If you're putting 40% down, for example, and you have a 680 FICO score, it doesn't matter. Like you're not, you, as long as you have a 680 FICO score, you're going to get the same pricing as you would have at a 780 FICO score because you're putting 40% down and the lender doesn't consider that to be a risk to them. Okay. Yeah. I have, my last couple of purchases have been owner care. So I haven't oh. had to deal with underwriting, but when I've had to do it, it's, it's just, I hate to say it, but it's, it's like they want your firstborn and all this paper. And I mean, it's all risk assessment. I feel like right? they're just trying to, yeah. Well, a couple of things, right? First of all, they're giving you hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. So like, would you just give somebody a hundreds of thousands of dollars? <laughs> Without. <laughs> Everyone complains about the process. <laughs> I don't see you giving people hundreds of thousands of dollars, totally. millions of dollars. Fair point. Yeah. yeah. That's, so that's the one <laughs> thing. And second of all, it's not really your money that you're lending. You're, yeah. You're lending someone else's money mm-hmm. and that's even worse. Right. Yeah. Because it's, yeah, that's actually that I never thought about. That's all really good points. Yeah. And they're going to, it has to hold up to an audit, mm-hmm. right? So everyone is lending money that some that somebody else is, and then it all of these loans are being packaged into what are called mortgage backed securities. For the most ninety ninety five percent of mortgages are being packaged into mortgage backed securities and sold to the public and institutional investors, typically institutional investors. You can't really buy mortgage backed securities unless you're spending ten thousand or more. And they're they're yeah, so they're they have to be when you and so when they're sold like this it's like a public commodity that's Mm -hmm. financial security that has to meet all these guidelines like every oftentimes it'll be a client that's got oh i'm putting like 50 percent down why did that why did the bank tear you can just foreclose (laughs) on me that there's nobody is in lending to foreclose nobody wants expensive right to do that yeah yeah it's super expensive and that's not how they make their money. They make their money by selling the loan and the person that they're selling it to, they are going to audit it. And it has to meet these requirements. Doesn't really matter. Well, maybe you can get some exceptions for X, Y, Z reason on a small guideline, but you can't, you have to be able to meet an audit or you can get in trouble. And uh, yeah. It's, it, you have there's a process and some of those rules have gotten a lot harder mm-hmm. after the Dodd-Frank Act of 2008 and because there was a lot of loans that weren't performed that didn't perform mm-hmm. because they weren't properly underwritten or there was fraud involved and so, yeah essentially and and some banks can be a little bit more onerous than others. Mm-hmm. Some each bank has their ability to put overlays on top of normal guidelines. Right. So as a broker, I'm t- I'm kind of like keeping that in mind. Like, does this person have some unique scenario that that I know that lender won't like because they don't like to use departing? Do they don't like to use? income from their departing residents when they're buying a new house. And so I'm going to use this particular investor because they know how to underwrite that. And they're a little bit more flexible with those mm-hmm. guidelines. Um, or this one's more flexible about self-employment. They're terrible about paperwork and they're slow, but they'll give me, they actually keep the loan in house and they're not selling it to the secondary market. And mm-hmm. they'll like during COVID, for example, I had a client that got was approved before the COVID guidelines switched, COVID guidelines switched. And then suddenly he was, lost his approval because he was self-employed and they changed the guidelines for self-employed. And I was able to take it to a lender that they had a little bit more holistic approach. They don't use automated underwriting and they looked at it as a whole. And, mm-hmm. and so they were able to lend on it because of that. That's the kind of, the game we play but yeah to your point it can be 
a pain, but re- there's a reason for that. We're not, I'm not trying <laughs> to give you problems, but. <laughs> yeah. I, and I think, but what you're saying too speaks to the fact, like going to someone like yourself, who's clearly you understand the nuances and you can tailor something just to go into your bank. They've got certain products. They don't know, they can't match you. I think that's the power of a broker, right? Like you clearly understand that and the nuance of someone's situation and what's going to be the best fit. Yeah. And it helps to have some experience doing complex self-employed files. So if you're doing a a borrower that's, they're buying their first home, they, they're a W-2 employee. So they have one <laughs> source of income. Mm-hmm. Their, their down payment is sitting in their bank account. I need six documents, right? I right. don't need much at all. <laughs> then compare that to somebody that has two or three S corps and 16 properties. <laughs> and some of them have commercial loans on them and some of them are on their personal credit. And maybe they don't keep really good records of that because entrepreneurs are notorious for being good at being creative, being good at building and finding interesting ways of earning more money and creative ways of doing that. But oftentimes it's like, when it comes to tax time, they're like, here you go. Here's this big pile of paper. I don't really know what's in there. Do do something for me. And and not everyone's like that, but yeah, you can really tell, like some people have their business super organized, a lot of records. And it's, I asked for all these documents and then they get them to me like, a few hours later, it's no big deal. Mm-hmm. But for some people, it's it's very hard to track down all their mortgage statements, track down this, track down that. Yeah. No, I hear that. I feel like when I was when I'm doing conventional, I try and be like really organized. I want them to be. It's just the faster you get them the documents, the sooner they can turn it around. But so let's say like this. I feel like it's this ultimate house hack, right? If someone's hey, I. And I, the other thing is, like, you're not going to live in an apartment forever. You're going to live there like a year, right? And then you could move out and keep your loan, right? As far as that. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Right. You can move out. Well, the mortgage note you're signing says that you're going to live there for a year. Okay. That's what I meant. But it's not like 10 years, right? It's just a, that's a pretty short amount of time. No, the, the mortgage note you're signing says that you intend to live there for one year. Mm-hmm. And there can be exceptions with that, right? You could have a job relocation. You could have a change in your family. There's lots of things that could cause exceptions to that. But typically, yeah, you could just buy a new primary every year without any. You do that a couple of times. <laughs> in this area, you can assume that if appreciation continues as it has for the last 50 years, then you can assume that three, 350, 400 to $500,000 home, they're all going to be worth over a million in by the time, you know, 30 years from now. Mm -hmm. And so if you do that three times in your career, then you have three assets that you can use to offset your retirement. I personally am not counting on social security. So that's my mindset for myself, Mm -hmm. my clients. And then you could pull the equity out and maybe get the house that you really want to live in. That's, you're going to have. 100%. Hundred percent, and and the nice thing about pulling out equity is it's you don't have to pay capital gains tax on. Mm-hmm. It's when you're getting a loan, those you're not taxed on those proceeds, which is nice. pretty sweet. Yeah, no, that, yeah, that's just if anyone's listening, it's just this is a window. So if someone's, what's the first step, right? I always tell people, hey, talk to a broker, see what you qualify for. But do you have any tips of? Because I think people are. We're investors, right? But people maybe starting out are very intimidated by the process. Like they don't really know where to start. (laughs) Yeah. Great question. It's, I think it helps to just talk. Yeah. Like you said, talk to somebody. I do end up texting a lot with my clients or Facebook messenger or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think, I think it's still good to just talk to somebody so you can get a feel because you're going to give them. You can give them documents and, and maybe you might feel more comfortable just going onto a website and uploading everything, but, and, and that's fine. I like people are used to that, mm-hmm. but for me, this person is going to have access to your social security number. They're going to have access to your date of birth, basically everything they do need to do to commit fraud I, with your, with <laughs> just your phone, like, it over. Have all of your stuff. And so it's good to just get a sense of how someone communicates. 
what their speed in getting back to you is. Is this someone that you're going to feel comfortable working with and maybe telling you, oh, okay, look, I found this on your credit report. Is there, what, is that real? Is that accurate? And then maybe we need to look at going through this or, yeah. If you're worried, it always helps to just have a quick conversation. The pro, for example, my process is for a, a new client that's thinking about getting pre-approved to purchase a home for the first time. I have like a brief 20 to 30 minute conversation, or even less sometimes just about what they do for work, what their goals are, how much they have saved and what they feel like is a comfortable monthly payment. And if there's anything coming up in terms of timing that could be relevant to the transaction, such as a, a lease some sort of inheritance coming in or anything like that could in impact the timing of a transaction. And then we talk a little bit. And then after that, if, if they feel comfortable, I send them a secure link where they can upload documents. And then I review them, fill out, take care of the application for them. Or I can just do the application on the phone too, if they prefer. Mm -hmm. And while we're having that com initial conversation and then, and then based on that, then we, if they move forward and update, upload documents, then we set a meeting where we'll get on Zoom and, and go over the numbers together. If they want to see the back end, how I do my calculations, how they can make changes to impact those qualifying numbers. Like maybe you have an auto loan for, I think the average is like almost $800 a month now. And I can show you It'll, you can qualify for about $150,000 more if you pay off this auto loan. Wow. Yeah. That, but that's kind of, dude, that's really strategic. If you just upload your docs to some faceless website that Google found, they're not going to coach you like that. And I think that's the benefit of that relationship, honestly. Yeah. To, to me, the more interesting part about mortgage is a kind of education and building that financial base and learning less about, oh, I just want to get this rate. That's mm -hmm. all that matters to me. And sure, you can get that rate, but you might want to look and see what that's costing you. And what's your plan? Do you think rates are going to go down in the next two years? Are you going to sell your home in the next two years? Because if you're going to pay extra money up front to get this low rate that you can brag about to your friends and family, and then you go and refinance next year, You've shot yourself in the foot. You've wasted thousands of dollars. Like mm. you should consider not taking that lower rate and paying less in fees because you told me that you're going to sell and move later, or you're going to refinance because you think rates are going down or you're planning on doing some, some other sort of process. So maybe you'd rather not do that. So you gotta, it helps to like understand how you can make certain toggles because that'll help you make decisions for the short term and the long term that make more financial sense for you and just build build wealth over time. Mm -hmm. Or that's the more interesting part of mortgage to me. Yeah, and I think you're really helping people cuz I they people don't understand like your debt to income and all those little tweaks. Like I've had to take my husband off my credit card, do those little things just to get our one point up <laughs> to get a Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, And the other thing I think you brought up, I just want to highlight is like, I think we're all holding our breath for rates to come down in this perfect storm of when to buy. But like, I think people forget. I hope you're not holding your breath because you're going to die. Right. <laughs> no, just kidding. I, I don't mean to be like pessimistic. I think we're all optimistic about rates coming down. And, mm -hmm. and, and so there's two things and it's worth no and worth knowing, not that people will totally understand, but Long story short is what you hear about in the news the most is the Federal Reserve's rate. So the Fed, which also is confusing because it sounds like it's like a political party or the government. The Fed is intentionally s separated from like the president. Like they're not supposed to be beholden. Be they report to Congress, but Congress doesn't tell them how to act, basically. Mm -hmm. So their job is to control monetary policy. They are trying to, their mandates are to keep inflation down and to keep 
employment up. And so they have this target of 2% inflation. And there's lots of different indices that people look at to observe inflation, right? Mm -hmm. And so recently, the Fed has raised their interest rate. And that lever that they pull, their interest rate lever, doesn't directly change mortgage rates. Of course, what the Fed does and what they say can impact mortgage rates, but that impacts short-term rates. What that Fed funds rate actually is, is the overnight lending rate that depository institutions lend money to each other at. Let your local bank, someone comes in to pull out some cash. They're like, oh shit, we're out of cash. I'm going to call other, my other friend banker down the street, different bank. And I'm going to give them some treasury bonds and they're going to give me some money. And they, and then that cash, that, that rate that they're being lent money at is based on what the Fed sets that at. And that is impactful because it determines like the supply. It, it determines how much risk companies are willing to take overall. In general, right? Because this makes, this is why the rate of HELOCs go up because HELOCs are adjustable. So business lines of credits, HELOCs, auto loans, they're all credit cards. They're all influenced by that short-term rate. And if your HELOC goes from a 1% rate to an 8% rate, you're going to be less likely to use that to purchase things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's just basic kind of macroeconomics. Mm -hmm. Is that what the Fed's doing to Influ help influence uh, behavior of companies to slow down the speed and, and slow down the inflation. And mortgage rates, they are set by the price of like mortgage-backed securities. And there's, this is a long, long, you can talk about this forever, but because there are other factors that influence mortgage rates, including the Fed, they did quantitative easing and they were buying mortgage-backed securities during COVID and it impacted the supply and, and the price in a kind of different way. But long story short is that mortgage rates are typically driven by inflation. And, and in, if you think about that, like if you're lending money to people over 30 years and that's the, your sole source of income, you're, you're getting fixed return on that in, on that investment over time, right? It's going to be whatever. If it's over 30 years, let's just say you get $1,000 a month every month for 30 years. Mm -hmm. Exactly what you're getting. If inflation is trending up, what do you have to do, right? To be able to still pay your employees and still be able to run your company. You have to increase your rates because all of your current investment, like all of your current pays are... You're still getting that thousand dollars every month from that from those loans, mm -hmm. so you need to up it so you can keep up with the cost of having running a business. Mm -hmm. So anytime inflation is going up, you can expect mortgage rates to go up because it's more based on that long term thought. And then on the other end, if inflation is going down, then yeah, you can offer more competitive rates. And inflation has come down a lot, and. Unfortunately, we haven't seen the equivalent drop in mortgage rates yet. And that's why a lot of people are predicting that mortgage rates will come down is because inflation has been trending downwards. But like we just had a report out today, this morning, that the CPI was up almost nearly 4%. And when it had been getting closer to three and a half. So that's... The mortgage bonds responded negatively to that. Rates went up. And it never goes down in a straight line either. At one point, inflation was like at 8 9%. So it, it has come down significantly, but it's still not <clears throat> like the Fed has this idea that they wanted to be at like 2 or near 2 before they can start lowering their rates. Mm -hmm. uh, so long story short is, it's not guaranteed that rates will come down. It's based on inflation. Inflation has gone down. And it hopefully will continue to help pull down mortgage rates. But there's some upwards pressure on them because inflation hasn't just come down. It's been come down and then it's going to bounce up a little bit. Mm -hmm. So if the economy continues to slow down, 
if prices continue to slow down, if oil keeps, then yes, we'll get that lower rate relief. When it's going to happen, who knows? Yeah. Well, historically, we're near averages. So. Mm -hmm. I think that we have to remember like it, it, that things fluctuate, but we can't be afraid to like, if it's a good investment, if it pencils, you just, you need to make, you need to, I don't know. I feel like you need to take action and not just wait for this perfect rate and that may never come or maybe years out or who knows. I had clients when the rates were really low, they're waiting for prices to come down. Now that <laughs> that's, and I'm just like, you know what? Just, you're going to keep waiting. Right. <laughs> Look at the history of prices. Yeah. <laughs> we had one instance in our life, and as a millennial, we had one instance in our lifetime, right when we came of age, that that housing prices went down dramatically. But that's not going to just like, happen again. Mm -hmm. um, and, and if you're going to just wait for that to happen, then you're going to miss out on, it's like waiting to put money into your retirement account. You cannot do that, right? Mm -hmm. You can't wait till you're 50 till you start putting money. You can. You just won't be, you won't be very successful at putting money into your retirement account because the money that you put in your twenties is going to be worth quadruple what you, what you put in or more. So it, yeah, it, it's ultimately you got it. The timing can always be better. It's like waiting to have a kid because of X, Y, Z reasons. <laughs> yeah. You can always be more financially stable. <laughs> but yeah. No, let me tell you. Yeah. I'm an older parent and I, yeah, it's hard. It's, yeah, you should have them when you're young, when you're not ready, when you're not financially ready. Just do yeah. it. That's, oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. We're kind of, this is so fun. I thought we can go on forever. Is there anything we didn't cover that you wanted to make talk about? Or as a, I think you have so much value as you're an investor and you're in lending, which I think is not everyone, is it also not everyone that's a broker of so, an investor so you probably have a different lens i'm assuming that you're helping clients with right that's more strategic yeah i think just that a lot of investing in real estate is become more popular in the sense that there's a lot of podcasts out there there's a lot of influence out there talking about it in different ways and i think there's it's there's good material out there but there's also a lot of material out there so I think it helps to like actually meet people and talk to people. For me, that made a big difference when I made, met people in person, made made friends and, and partners in, in that investing world and learned directly from their experience. And I don't know, some people are good about just like learning from books and then being able to figure it out. Um, me personally, it, it was more of a hands-on type thing and then mm -hmm. like meeting people in person and learning from them. And everyone has their own kind of journey and thoughts about what to do with real estate. But yeah, to me, it's, it's one really tangible way of building a retirement that is, has a proven track record that you can also have a lot of control over. That's a little bit, it's more active, right? It's not as easy as just putting money into a 401k and forgetting it, forgetting about it, but it's more tangible. You can, you can make the improvements yourself. You can increase square footage. You can increase rent. You can increase value. There's a lot of things you can do that you have more control of than you might feel like you have in, in the stock market. Like I, I've had some like, success there and I've had some failures. And I like to think that I have some control over it, but mostly it's just luck. I think there's plenty of people that, do it. I, can't, I shouldn't say that because mm -hmm. there's plenty of people that do well, but, but you don't have the same ability to control your asset like you do in, in, in the stock market. And you're just having real estate, like owning a business, right? Owning, I think the number one way of building wealth is probably, you know, the way that you can build the most wealth is probably by owning business. And then the number two way is probably by real estate. Because mm -hmm. when you own a business, you get to, you have control over it. The difference between owning Berkshire Halfway and controlling the company and doing something like, like he, like Buffett did versus 
just being like an investor that sits on the sideline. Yeah, like you can make some money doing that. Um, but it's totally different when you're steering the ship. No, I feel the same way. Exactly. Because I feel like I can control it. I can do things to improve it. I, I yeah, I 100%. <laughs> and for me too, it's always, and whenever I'm looking at property, I'm like, okay, if everything went to shit, if I, I lost everything, could I just go and live there? <laughs> with, you know, with, with like, when, when I think about this dog market, I'm always like, well, if everything collapsed, that's all gone. Right? It's all gone. No, we have furnished rentals and I'm like, can we fit in this one? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, this has been so fun. I have a couple kind of wrap up questions. You talked about this a little bit. I always like to ask, like, this is, could be a meeting one or however you want to take it. I mean, top business or life advice to live life on your own terms. Yeah, that's a hot topic right now. Living life on your own terms. I, I, I think in order to live your life on your own terms, you have to be in like and in, keep investing in yourself in different ways. You need to invest in your health. Like you need to exercise. You need to exercise. You need to sleep. You need to eat well. Like all those. You need to constantly be reevaluating what you're doing with that and investing in those things. Like you need to invest in, into like, you need to invest your money, right? You need to take care of that in a way that you have, if you're working a job, you want to be able to feel like you can quit that job and get a different job at any time. Cause you don't want, you don't want to feel like they own you. And it's, there's nothing wrong with working for somebody. And I'm in W2 employee, but I, my pay is all based on commission, but you want to be able to feel like you're in control in the sense that you could get a different job at any point or learn another skill on the side and feel like you could get employed elsewhere. I think there's a lot of studies now that show that moving for people that are employed will increase their salary dramatically over time because you, yeah, you don't want to be at the mercy of someone else. And then, yeah, like, Obviously, diversifying is sort of everyone talks about that. I'm more invested in real estate because that's what I know. But I do have, I do work with a great local financial advisor who I, everyone, like, I used to think I'm not going to pay a financial advisor. I, I know. <laughs> you know what you're doing. I know what I'm doing. Like, I understand. <laughs> and, and there's different ways to pay them. And it's mm. it ultimately, like I just sent them him an email the day because we're working on a development project that's coming through and I'm trying to figure out if we're going to set it up as an S corp or, a, or a just run it as pay everyone out in 1099. And what's the most efficient way for taxes. Mm -hmm. And so like those kinds of questions are very valuable, like the long-term planning. And yes, I'm probably not maximizing the, the return that I'm getting on some of my index funds. But also, I can't touch them, right? He's touching them, and I'm not going to mess them up. And I don't have to worry about that. Like, <laughs> when I do my the, the Roth IRA stuff, it's automatically all done for me, and he, he does the conversion for me. Like, it's just, it's out of my hands, so I don't have to think about that. So I can send, spend my mind thinking on my other things, because I it took me a long time to figure out, like, what I wanted to do with that stuff. Mm -hmm. But then I could just, you know, it's like, I trust him to do it. And then when I have questions, I can call him and yeah, he charges a premium, but he gives excellent advice and I, overall it's going to be much better for my financial health than not. I, I, I love that you took a holistic approach to that answer. Cause I think we think like investing is just purely like in an asset, but it's also on ourselves because this business is like mindset and it's not just right. Real estate. It's. Yeah. And, and I think there's an, a third point to that too, is like that your, your family and work-life balance, I think is super important. And uh, I think there's this thought and I was just, we were just interviewing someone the other day who was talking about that. And I, I don't think, I think balance is a myth. A lot of people like to say that they've got that balance, but someone that works nine to five, that has a perfectly clear cut times that they're you know, spending with their family, they're spending at work. As entrepreneurs might look at that and be like, man, that's great life balance. And then someone that works nine to five might look like an, I look at an entrepreneur that's like going out to lunch with a bunch of realtors and whatever networking and doing fun stuff, like traveling for conferences and be like, oh man, they, they have a lot of fun. They, they definitely have a great work-life balance. 
I, I think everywhere you look, you're going to find someone that has a better work-life balance, but you just got to come to terms with what works for you and, and your family and, mm -hmm. and make that speed because that's what's important here is your family and how money helps to support that, but what's, can't have one. There's no point in having one without right. the other, right? <laughs> yeah, the balance thing. I, I think it's, I've decided it's like seasons, right? Sometimes it's just busier and I'm not, I like, I, yeah, I totally appreciate that. Okay. This is like a solely one. So however you want to take it, how, what's your superpower and how have you used it? Like in your investing or your business or whatnot? Oh man, super. <laughs> Honestly, what's the biggest thing? for me has just been like friends like that, like reaching out to people like connections through warm. The only way I've gotten loans is through, is through people that are friends and friends of friends and that I've met and made friends with and have referred me deals. Like I'm, I, if you want to boil your business down into one small basic thing for me, it's just like meeting people, being nice to them and, Becoming friends with them. Like that's in talking to them. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that I've done to get paid. There's nothing more than that. And then, but sometimes you talk more about other things and it generates different results. Mm -hmm. Like when I was cooking, I had to do a certain amount of chops and a certain amount of prep and a meet X, Y, Z deadlines. Very different, right? Mm -hmm. But in this business, it's much more about. And, and some people don't do it differently, right? Some people will just spend X amount of time cold calling every day. And that's how they build their business. Um, yeah. That's the hard way though. Don't do. <laughs> but yeah. For example, a project that we I briefly mentioned, we're building a 40 unit affordable housing project in Salem. Came across my desk because of a friend through the Asian Real Estate Association. My brother's friend. Turns out he'd done affordable housing for 25 years. He helped he, he, a client and friend of mine that went to law school with my other brother, they're running a nonprofit who's the developer on it, who reached out to us about this project. Like, it's all just friends and friends of friends, the architect friend on it. <clears throat> and now we just got 20 million in funding for the federal government. And it's not all we're, it's a lot of talk. There's going to be a big construction project that's going to happen by the end of the year, beginning of next year, but it's nothing more than making friends and talking and meeting with people. I think we forget it's a people business and it's that simple. It's not, it's just showing up and contributing. And yeah, I, I love that. And um, that's a good reminder because I think we get in our heads about it a little bit, right? <laughs> okay. So I know you have, you have like a resource you'd recommend your own po podcast, something that you'd like to share as a resource. Oh yeah. You can check out our podcast. It's called Realize Gains Podcast. Uh, it's, you can find it wherever you find podcasts or on my website. It's at, it's Jordan leemortgage.com you can find my blog and my website I, I write a weekly blog that i send out to um, my realtors and financial advisor contacts and then yeah that's those are the two main things that i that we publish regularly that's awesome that you blog i that's really that's some discipline i love it honestly i did it because i wanted to learn the language of mortgage mm -hmm. and so i worked myself to learn macroeconomics and and just write, but it takes me an hour every week and keeps me up to date with market. And it allows me to talk about finance because I didn't take economics in college and I haven't read many econ books, but yeah, it helps keep you up on news and just understand what hap what happens beyond the mortgages and what factors can contribute to that world. It helps to know guidelines for constructing a deal, but mm -hmm. We're talking to investors and, and talking to people about real estate in general. They're more, mm -hmm. I think people in general are more, most interested in macroeconomics. Mm -hmm. That's, yeah, that's what clearly you're very articulate and it was very um, understandable because it can get pretty, I don't want to say nerdy, right? But I was <laughs> really, I really appreciated how you made it very approachable. Clearly that's working. So last question you mentioned about how can people find you, work with you, reach out to you maybe for... Mortgage stuff, all that good stuff. Yeah. Jordan Lee Mortgage is my tag on Instagram and Facebook and my website. There And my, yeah, Jordan at Jordan Lee Mortgage is my email. All just that 
should be able to find it on the Google. Perfect. You're Googleable. <laughs> yeah. It's been really fun. I thanks for taking the time. And yeah, it was fun to unpack. I know there was a lot of other stuff, but this, I feel like there's a lot of value in what you had to share. So thank you. Oh, clearly. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate it.